everybody what's going on i know it's like it's been a minute but i'm here i've been busy guys i keep saying that but i'm here i'm here i'm here i have a special new guest today and i do not know his story so i'm excited to hear his story guys i would like you to welcome mr roman barksdale jr to yes lambert house documentary spotlight how are you doing sir I'm doing great, neat, fantastic. I um, love it. <laughs> I love it. You, you are a special guest today and you are in the spotlight. So I understand from you, you grew up in Lambert. So I want to know yes, your story. Um, when yeah. did you move to Lambert and where did you come from? Okay, well, I always lived in the Bronx. Um, I came from the South Bronx, mm. 586 Prospect Avenue, 149th Street. Wow. Um, yeah, it was literally the belly of the beast back then. And I moved to Lambert, uh, 1971. Mm-hmm. And we were one of the first families in that building. And what building that, that was? Um, uh, 2114. 2114 on Bryant 21... Avenue. And at that time, the bill, you know, um, and each building, the doors had different colors. So I was from the green building. Right. Okay. Okay. So I was, I was 15, I moved in. Um, it was like a fantasy, um, you know, living in, in, in tenement buildings uh, up until the age of 15 or 14. Mm-hmm. And you move in and you're the first family in there. And that was like so exciting. You didn't even want to leave the house to go to school um, because, you know, you, <laughs> you're you in a duplex, right? And, um, and you have two bathrooms. You have a bathroom and a half, one upstairs, one downstairs, all the closet space you need. Now, I had three sisters. I'm the youngest boy. And for the first time, I had my own room because when we lived on Prospect Avenue, I slept in the living room. My sisters had their rooms and my mom and dad had their room. So now that I have my room, it's a sense of independence. And um, we, um, we 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 were very, very happy there, I have to admit. And as time went on and we, and people started to move into the building, it was, family. We like literally embraced each other. We were kids, not trying to be adults. We embraced our childhood. Nice. You know what I'm saying? And everybody was like-minded when we were, you know, when we was kids, nice. though we was teenagers. Yeah. You know, we got into stuff. However, there was love all around us. Um, the parents, they knew each other. They'd sit in the front of the building, So uh, everybody, everybody's mother had the first name. My mother was Ma Boxdale, Ma Stinson, um, Ma Hicks, on and on and on. And, um, you know, we played ball. We rode our bikes in packs, Mm. you know, and um, everybody wanted to dress well. You know, especially the guys want to impress the girls, the little girls at the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was it was a sunny day every day with us because even when it rained outside, we knew how to congregate in the building peacefully, not rowdy, peacefully. And we would play our music in the building when it was cold outside. And... Um, As time went on, new um, people moved in the building, and that just meant new friends. Mm. And everyone acclimated very easily. They, I mean, you know, it was no backbiting. It was no fighting at that time. Uh And, you know, we just wanted to, I have to admit, we just wanted to laugh. That's all we did. We just laughed and we joke we listened to music and you know we were worry free at the time because like I said we were all like um the youngest was must have been KK who 
when I met him, he was only 12 years old, but he was like king comedian. He missed his calling because to this day, KK had us laughing all day, every day. The mm-hmm. same thing with James, AKA crazy. And um, then we had Chris Tapper who lived on the top floor. Um, he knew all the parties with that. <laughs> With the girl. So everyone had their special talent when we were children. You know, wow. um, I was the quiet one, always in the scene, always behind the scenes. Nobody knew I could sing um, because when I moved to Lambert, it was a whole different vibe from when I was um, on Prospect Avenue. You see, back in the 70s and the late 60s, where I came from, everybody was into music. Mm-hmm. You could walk down the street and you hear people playing music. I'm talking about like somebody's practicing on their bass, somebody's practicing on their guitar, drums, whatever. So as, as time went on, um, we matured. And um, I remember Arthur Cryer. Arthur Cryer. Arthur had the community room, which is unheard of today. It was the community room where all the um, the units got together from all the buildings um, from across the street. For, I'm just talking about every building. We all met once again as kids in this community room and there was no riff. There was no riff at all. I'm talking about, you know, um, my game was ping pong. I, I wasn't a, a pool player, but you know, everybody had their game that they went to. But it was there in Lambert, especially in that community room, is where we learned and and it was training to be social. It was training, and I carry this with me today to learn how to network and to talk to another individual. You know, and that was um, paramount for us to be able to communicate and not saying, oh, our building is better than your building and yada, yada. That never happened. Because we would, across the street, would come over to our side. We would go over to their side and hang out, shoot ball. Um, Oh, my gosh. Speaking about ball. Now, the ball players... The un, and I call them the unsung ball players that could have been NBA players. Um, you know, I had a game. Of course, I'm going to say I had a game. But yeah, I had a game. But then you had you had people like Horse. You had people like James White. You had people like um, um, Tony. Um, you had people like David Bailey. You had people like Kevin Stinson. Now, Kevin... Tony and um, Dave, these guys was only five, seven, but they can slam the ball in the hoop. They can slam the ball in the hoop. Now, now Tony wasn't much of a jumper, but you couldn't get the ball away from him. And if Tony shot the ball, he's going to make it in there. You know, so these were the, the, you know, the type of guys I used to love to be around because they sharpened my tools. So when I went elsewhere, they would be like, oh, my gosh, Scott Butch got game. <laughs> and, um, you know, we ride our unicycles. But I, I, I want to go back to Arthur Cryer, yeah. who allowed us to work every summer with Tip. Wow. We all had jobs. We all had money in our pocket. We all had something to do. And then up there at the park, you know, we had the basketball games, the tip tournaments. And then after that, somebody would break out their DJ equipment and boom, they'd start DJing. I remember, um, true story, I remember uh, looking at Raheem from the Furious Five. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day he was sitting in the park. He may not remember this. He was sitting in the park and he was practicing his rhymes. And I looked at him and I said, and this was way before... um, the Sugar Hill Gang came out with that thing, but and and he was practicing his. And I looked at him and I was like, "What in the world is he doing?" <laughs> then the next thing I know, boom, kid blew up. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that was inspirational. So with that being said, um, so we had athletes, we had um, cats that was musicians. Now my wife, she's from Lambert and she's a hall of famer. Um, and she was in the Olympics really? as a hurdler. And she, to, to this day, she still holds some records. And what is your wife's name? Her name, her, her maiden name is Kim Whitehead. Okay. Okay. AKA Kim Boxdale. Now I got that. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's so, so, um, before they were GQ, I knew them as the Rhythm Makers and Arthur's Me son. Too. I knew them as the Rhythm Makers. Yes. Yes. So Arthur's son um, was the bass player. Mm. And, um, one day I walked up to uh, Sabu and I said, yo, Sabu, I can sing. He looked at me like, yeah, all right. So eventually he invited me. Um, time, time goes on. I ran into Sabu and he said, you still sing? I said, yeah. So he says, well, come on to our studio. And that was in the Concourse Village where they used to rehearse. And I was down there and Tony Lopez was their manager. And I sang for them. And Tony said, yo, what makes you think you can sing? I said, everybody that listened to me, he said, boom, that's the answer I was looking for. He says, everybody else says, well, I know I can sing. I said, everybody else that listened to me thought I can sing. But nothing ever came of that because then time went on again and Sabu broke away from uh, GQ. I don't know what happened, right. but he broke away from um, GQ. And one day I'm walking by Arthur's house and I'm hearing some live music and I'm digging it. So I decide, well, you know, Arthur, we cool. I think I was about 20. Yeah, I was in my 20s. And I go upstairs and um, Sabu got this new crew and they jamming. And I just walked to the mic and they was playing Disco Night. And I sang Raheem's part. Arthur came from downstairs, was like, and, and he only said one thing to me. He looked at me, you're in. And he went back upstairs. Wow. That, that was it wow. that was it because Arthur is a is a is a is a um doo-wop hall of famer and if you couldn't sing and if you couldn't cut it <laughs> he'd let you know like mm -hmm. yo because he taught me the difference between having what it takes and having potential and that's a lesson I carry with me 30 40 years down the line he told me he says if I told you, Roman, that you have potential, that means keep working at it. You got something, but you just don't have it yet. Right. But if somebody says, yo, you got what it takes, come on. Mm -hmm. so that's why he said, you got what it takes, come on. Mm -hmm. So then um, after that, I branched off um, with the Mean Machine. Okay. The Mean Machine was on the Sugar Hill label. And they signed before I got to them, but they were the first rappers to do the bilingual rap. That was with um, Danny Rivera. And he and I are collaborating to this day. Wow. On some but he is um, the grandfather of bilingual rap. He's the guy that put it on the map. And um, like I said, we're working on some like really, really hot stuff. Wait till it comes out. It's going to be fire. Wow. Um, yeah, and, and there's another cat that I am um, still working with. I grew up with him in Lambert, his uh, AKA genius, Gene McNair. Okay. And, and he and I, we're working on a project um, as well. Um, Herc said that he heard one of the projects and he liked it. So, yeah, um, I got to so. get Gene on the show with him. Yes, but that is such an interesting story. So, this, this is the whole point of this platform. All of that had so much to do with your journey, your life journey, your foundation, you know, of music. Like, cause I listened to you. I was like, oh my God, like your voice is amazing. <laughs> you making me blush oh, on, on Zoom. I, to you. <laughs> I, I was like, oh my God, I don't know about him. 
voice is crazy. Somebody's gonna say, "Oh, B, how you didn't know?" And then, and then they're gonna tell me a story. You were there when da da da. You know, like it's, my memory is crazy. But yeah. Yes. yeah. So now, tell me about your journey. You you went on to do music. Now, now there's a down there's a downside to 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 that story because. For a long, long, and I mean a long, long time, um, I became addicted to crack. Mm -hmm. For years, I'm talking about like years, I'm talking about being homeless, um, sleeping on the train, sleeping in your cardboard boxes in the winter time. Um, and that was a battle within itself. But mm -hmm. one of the things that pulled me out is when I listen to the radio and I hear somebody playing guitar and I hear somebody singing and I say to myself, yo, I can do better than that. I can do better than that. And it became so intense that the journey coming out of that was actually for me more intense than the journey of being in the belly of the beast. Ooh, that's deep. Mm, that's elaborate on that. That's that's deep. <laughs> people won't understand, and I understand so much of what you're saying. Music, people don't get. If music is in you, if that, if if it's in you, it's burning. It's burn. You can't even shake that. You you could say, I ain't gonna do music no more. It's gonna haunt you. It, it, it's like a serious drug. I get it. It is. It is. It's it's. It was a power laying dormant in me, waiting to ignite, waiting to explode. And it was so intense that even, I mean, you name a program in New York, I done been through there. Mm. And in every program I went into, I would start this singing group and, and, and um, frankly, I would forget why I was in treatment because now I'm focused on this career. So when every time I came out, I would fall again because I miss what I went in there for mm. because the music was so in my head. So now I had to learn balance. I had to learn balance. balance. So eventually I wound up becoming, um, and it's interesting how things work out in your favor because I became a counselor in three of the programs that I went into. One was Phoenix House. I became a clinical counselor in there. I became a clinical counselor at Samaritan Village. And then I became a, a, a clinical counselor at Daytop Village in Far Rockaway. Wow. That's and then I worked a couple of years in the Methadone Clinic and giving back. And to this day, I am still giving back. I'm living in Connecticut right now. And I retired as a peer engagement specialist um, slash recovery coach uh, for three years at that hospital. And now I'm working at an agency in Apex doing something completely different, but yet still giving back and still maintaining my music and my sobriety wow. of, thank you, of um, 20 years. Wow. That is such a great story. It's such a great story for, you know, I always say um, sometimes people are apprehensive about coming on the show. They might have went in a different direction. Everybody goes in a certain direction. It may not be drugs. It may be something else. But that's our that's our life. We're going to fall to get back up again. For a moment that that just you just said, I'm I'm not doing this no more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fighting back emotion. Okay, you don't um, really have to share it, but I just... No, no, you know. no. Let's go for it. No, no. I want to do this. Christmas Day, my mother died in my arms. And that was the time and my sister looked at me and she said, you need to be the man of this family now because I was the only boy. Mm. It took maybe um, about a couple of months after that, but um, I put it to you like this. 
when I walked into treatment, I already stopped. Mm. I had already stopped. Um, I just needed somewhere to get my head together and get my game plan together. But I walked in, already made up my mind. So there was nothing that the counselors or the groups could say to me because my mind was already made up. And when I came out, I executed my plan flawlessly and never looked back. Mm -hmm. Never looked back. Yes, that is You know, Mm -hmm. and, and... I have to contribute that to some of the characters, um, and I'll say the word characters, that I knew in Lambert. Um, Now, there wasn't always a sunny side to Lambert. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I've seen my shares of shootings. I've seen my shares of people passing away right in front of me from a gunshot. I've seen my shares of other projects coming in and wanting to dominate, but we wouldn't let it happen. Mm -hmm. But we had to fight for our territory as well. Mm -hmm. And we had to let it be known that if you came into Lambert, it's not going to be an easy win for Mm y'all. So we had to stand our ground as well. And we stood our ground just so we can have fun at the end of the day. Now, the funny part about that is sometimes, yeah, we would fight amongst each other. However, (laughs) if I fought one of my friends, it was always a fair one. (laughs) Not only was it a fair one, probably by the end of the night, we going out to the club together. Yeah. So that's how we rolled up in there. We had our differences. We resolved our differences, but we kept it moving. We did. We really did. So all all of that, and you grew up and you saw so much. What do you think about, I don't know when was the last time you've been to Lambert. What do you think about the gentrification going on? Um, What do you think about that? From what I understand, they don't have a lot of programs, but I'm I'm still researching it, you know, but what do you think about that? My in-laws, they still live in Lambert. So Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I, we go to Lambert. And um, sometimes when I go there, I walk around and reminisce on the side that I came from. Mm -hmm. But then when I come full circle and I look at that tall building and then I look across the street on the other side where they tore down the other building, my heart cries. Because when I look, I see memories. Mm. When I look at that that building, for some reason, um, once again, Arthur Cryer and and that whole family is always in my heart. And before I look all the way to the top, I'll say, wow, that's where I used to rehearse at, at Arthur's house. So it's sad, but let me just say this. Back in the 70s, in the 80s, right? There was kids out there all day, every day. The last couple of years I've been going around there, I don't see, I hardly see any kids playing. That's the truth. Where are they? You know, um, literally, where are they? I don't see anybody riding their bikes. Um, I see like once in a while, I may go around there and they're shooting ball. Mm-hmm. But as we was playing ball, you still saw the kids riding the bikes. You still saw the girls running in between the balls, balls. right? Running the kids running it, between the balls. Yeah, it's literally. True. Yeah, literally. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's um, it is completely different. It's 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 just for us, as they say, oh geez, it's more mm-hmm. of a memory lane type of situation yeah. now, mm-hmm. and. I can't help but think about all the good times and all the fun that we had. And it molded me to the person I am today. Well, it, 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 it helped mm-hmm. a lot mold me because like I said in the beginning, it was Lambert that, that gave me my social skills. Mm-hmm. It was Lambert that gave me my networking skills. 
that I still hone and carry to today. Yeah, Lambert was, uh, it, it did a lot for a lot of people. And um, and I'm, I thank you for sharing your story. Um, crack hit Lambert really hard, you know, and we, we, we haven't really touched on that because that's not what this is about, but we know it happened. And yeah, it did. most people did it, went through it, got over it and moved on. You know what I mean? That's, that's life. Yeah. It's not just a Lambert story. That's a life story. It happens all over the world. You know, people go through stuff. And, you know, the thing is you go through yeah. you over it and you move on. Now, what are you doing now? I know you told, you said about some projects you have. What are you doing now? You said you was retired, but then you're, you're working. But what are you doing now musically? What is going on? Where can we follow you? Where can we reach you? Okay, so I'm about to put my stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, it's time. Um, I'm such a perfectionist that I might hear something. I might hear something that nobody else notices in the song. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I got to do that again. But I'm like, you know, Roman, just, just, just put it out because there's a lot of people that's, that want to hear what I've done. There's a lot of people. Oh, with me and my guys, the fellas. Okay. I'm currently singing with the guys, uh, the fellas. I have, uh, it's called, uh, he's called Baby Ray Moya. Mm. I have Joe Rivera, who is in the doo Hall of Fame. Okay. With Joe Quay D D Devonich and myself. And um, we traveled the United States just doing Motown songs and stuff like that. And, um, I have to admit, my doing that with them and being on stage with all of these stars and, and, and things and such, and I, I, I look at them and like the story I just told you, sometimes I'm in disbelief from coming out of the belly of the beast and then and now traveling, doing what I want to do, living my dream. That's beautiful. You God know, good. And God is good all the time, for real. All the time. All the time. Yeah. All the time. And amazing. You're making me tear up. That that's an amazing story. That's you know, it's it's, it's yeah. There's nothing that can hold yeah. us down. Nothing yeah. can hold us down. But I saw. okay, you mm -hmm. you bumped your head. You fight your way up out of it. And then you engage your dream like never before. Yeah. Never mistake anyone's confidence. Right. For being Sometimes when people are confident, they know their assignment. Like I know my assignment. They know their assignment. They found it. They know it. And they live in it. They know their Ooh, assignment. You, you know, know what? your you assignment. Getting to, you getting ready to go somewhere when you yeah, say that. I know my assignment. <laughs> <laughs> like sometimes, you know, people haven't found the assignment. I know what I was put here to do. I got my assignment. I know my yeah. assignment. Thank you so much, Roman. You are so welcome. I'm going to send you a copy in a few minutes of one of the songs I'm working on. Thank you.